Well, all right. Welcome back to the As It Should Be podcast YouTube channel. And, uh, well, I'm going to do another Ranking the Albums video. I'm, I'm hoping not to do just nothing but Ranking the Albums videos, but so far that's my only idea, so I'm sticking with it. And I have lots and lots of lists that I have to work through, so there's many more videos to make in that vein, but I'll try to expand at some point. You know, um, but I'm going to, I usually say this at the end of the videos, but I'm going to put it at the front of the videos just in case you don't make it to the end. And that is, anybody who's digging these videos, if you like what you see and you want to see more and uh, or you hate it and you hate me and you want to watch the TV and curse me out, subscribe. Uh, you know, like and comment and all that stuff. And as I've said on the previous videos, the reason why YouTube uh, uh, people are always at you to do this is because YouTube needs for you to tell it that you like the videos so then it knows to show the videos to other people. The only way for the videos to kind of get uh, a wider audience is for the people who are watching it to uh, let YouTube know that they're into it, right? So uh, that's a good way to help people out for free without having to without having to go buy a record or go pay to go see a show. You know, click do a couple of clicks at the end. There you go. But anyway, so this particular video I am going to do, I'm going to count down, I'm going to rank down, rank down, count down, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm going to rank the albums of Todd Rundgren, okay? Now, not the Utopia albums, no Naz albums, just the proper Todd solo albums, and I'm only going up to 1991's Second Wind. The reason being that that's really kind of how late I went into it before I stopped buying the new albums. And uh, so anything after Second Wind, most of the albums after Second Wind, I don't know that well. And I just, uh, yeah, I just really want to stick with the stuff that I really have a history with. And there is one post Second Wind album that I really love that if I had it on this list would rank pretty high, in fact, like really high, and that's Liars from 2003 or 4, something like that. That is a really great, 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 great later period Todd Rundgren album that I really wish I could put on this list, but, you know, what are you going to do? So, anyway, why don't I get right on it? Okay, so coming in at number 13, it's going to be 13 albums, by the way, coming in at number 13, Second Wind. Yeah, I'm ha I have Second Wind last, and well, as I mentioned already, that's kind of the album, the last album, the last new Todd album that I went out and bought, and well, there you go. I have it on the bottom of my list. That's why. I don't like this record. I never liked it. Well, now, it, now it came out in January 1991. He had decided he was going to do a new album kind of the same way all you Joe Jackson fans out there. Remember how Joe Jackson did the Big World album? where he did live shows performing exclusively new material in front of an audience, had everybody, you know, shut up and be quiet, no whistling and everything, saving their, their applause for long after the fade out and all that kind of stuff because they wanted a, a studio album but with the live feel. Well, that's what Todd did for Second Wind. He got his nearly human band back together and went, and he did some shows at the uh, Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. And, you know, a series of shows and recorded all these songs and made this album. And I actually had tickets to go to one of those shows. I actually had tickets to go to one of those shows, but I did not go. I did not go. I was really, really kind of at fever pitch with Todd Rundgren around that, around that time. 89, 90 were kind of really big. But those were kind of my, my honeymoon years with Todd Rundgren. And so I'd gotten into him in 1989. And, uh, well, that's when I really, really got into them. And so I had a ticket to go to one of these Second Wind recording session shows, and I, I didn't go. Now, you know, my friend, my best friend Brent, shout out to Brent, we were going to go. The two of us were going to go to the show. And what happened is that the day of the show, I, I don't remember it that well. I just seem to remember that I was having anxiety attacks that day. And, you know, and I tend to have anxiety attacks now and again and get freaked out about stuff. And, um, well, this was an anxiety attack day. And Brent came over. He came to the house ready to go to the show. And I just said to him, hey, man, I don't feel like going. 
I just kind of basically explained my whole situation to him, and I said, I don't, I don't really want to go. Let's, let's just hang out here. And that's all I really wanted to do. And he just kind of shrugged and went, yeah, okay. Because he wasn't really that big of a talk fan. And uh, he was really going just to go with me. And his whole thing was, ah, that money's long since spent anyway. I don't care. He was just as happy to hang out. So we just hung out at my place that night. And I didn't go to the show. All right. Which I kind of regret just because just for the experience. But in the end, when the album came out, I went and bought it. Dave released. I was so excited. And uh, brought it home. And I just, I hated it. It was just this really adult, contemporary, bland kind of music that was just, it, it, it was nothing that I liked about Todd was on these records. It was just this bad, I, I, well, to use the term again, it was adult contemporary. And I just, I, was like, eh. I, I just wasn't into it. I kept going back to it every once in a while and giving it a, a, a listen and listen and listen. And it just, it never, ever, never stuck. It never grew on me. I ended up selling the CD at some point. I don't have it anymore. And that's basically that. I mean, yeah. And, well, there you go. So now it's number 13 on my list. It's at the bottom of my 13 LP list. Okay, so, well, coming in at number 12 is the album that preceded Second Wind. You talk geeks know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's Nearly Human. 1989's, May 1999's, Nearly Human. Yeah, boy, talk about an album I was excited for. Now, I had just gotten into Todd. I basically was brand new into being obsessed with Todd when this album was coming out. So this was, I would, yeah, so really, in a way, Nearly Human and Second Wind are the only two new Todd Lundgren albums I went and I bought on Dave release as an obsessive fan, and I stopped after that. But, uh, Nearly Human, I had just started listening to his stuff because I had always loved Hello, It's Me. And there was I Saw the Light and all that kind of stuff. And it took me so long to start digging into his records and like listening to his stuff. But what did it was when Rhino did their reissue campaign where they put out his entire catalog, all his solo albums, all his Utopia albums, his Nas records, everything. And I would go to Rainbow Records and I would go to the Todd section and there would be like, it seemed like a hundred CDs there, and I would just look at all of them, and I would stare at them, and look at the back, and look at the years on them, and like try to figure out what was what. Yeah, and then once I'd gotten a bunch of the, the Rhino reissued CDs and started getting sufficiently into his records, then I started noticing that he was start playing a lot in the late around late '89, and uh, well, he lived in the Bay Area at the time, so he was playing the Fillmore a lot, and that's where I saw Todd Rundgren for the first time in 1989 at the Fillmore. He was doing a benefit gig, and Paul Kantner was opening at an acoustic solo set and yeah I went to that show and it was just like seeing God G-O-D-D right in front of me and I remember I got busted for trying to take photos on my little instamatic film camera I was just a dumb 19 year old kid and I'm sitting here trying to take photos of Todd on stage I was very close with my flash on on my instamatic camera well they grabbed me from the audience and they pulled me out front and made me rip out the, the film and give it to them check in my camera at the coat check and then fortunately they let me go back into the show but uh, that, that was a hairy one and I had gotten sufficiently into him just in time for the news that Nearly Human was going to be coming out and the one of a nail hit the radio and I loved that song it was a great song so I was really stoked went out and bought it day of release and I brought it home and you know, kind of like Second Wind, it was a little on the, the adult contemporary side for me. I mean, I realize now that what he was going for was more of a, you know, R you know like a Motown-ish, R&B-ish, you know, maybe Philly Soul kind of vibe. And he brought a band into the studio and did complete live takes, uh, you know, a la the side four of something, anything. It was full band, a very full band, you know, horns and backing vocalists and the whole thing. But every note you hear on the record is live in the studio. And I really loved that approach, but I just wasn't that into the stuff. Um, but there were songs, unlike Second Wind, I mean, I couldn't tell you a favorite song from that record. I just didn't like any of it. This one, I really liked The Wand of a Nail. I liked Unloved Children. And, you know, some of the other stuff somewhat. But in the end, it wasn't a record that I returned to a lot. Um, 
But yeah, so there you go. So that puts it at line number 12. Okay, so coming in at number 11 is Runt, The Ballad of Todd Rundgren. Okay, now many consider this to be his second solo album. And really, I guess it kind of is, but at the time, it was his second Runt album. Now, when he first left the Nas and started making albums, he was making them under the name Runt, as though it was a band. And in the band of Runt, the Runt, the band was supposed to be him and the Sales Brothers, you know, Hunt and Tony Sales. And uh, on the second album, The Ballad of Todd Rundgren, it kind of started becoming more Todd, and, you know, like there's less of... of uh, one of them, the one that plays drums, there was less of him on the album, and you know he started bringing other people in. He started doing more of it himself, and you know it just it became less of a band, and it wasn't really truly a band to begin with. But at this point, it became kind of clear that it was really just going to be Todd. I mean, it wasn't a very successful record, and after the release of Something Anything, the third album, which was his first, which was like his breakthrough record. Bearsville wanted to release the first two Runt albums together as a double album called Todd Rundgren's Rack Job. But that, that was going to be in 1973, but Todd kind of put the kibosh on that because he wanted to do a new album. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are probably pulling their hair out going, how the hell could this be towards the bottom of the list? You know, I really don't like this one that much. I mean, I, re- I mean, come on, I have it above just above nearly human in second win, which I didn't have much good to say about it. Yeah, I mean, you would think that an album from 1971 by Todd Rundgren would be just like wall-to-wall great, right? And to a lot of you guys, it is. Man, I just can't get into this one. I just don't think there are that many good songs on it. There's The Range War. And I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, really, there's only three songs that I think I like on it. I really like the opening track, Long Flowing Robe. Bleeding is good. Uh, Boat on the Charles, I always liked. But man... It's mostly just stuff that I just can't get into. Um, I mean, I tried, I've tried, and I've tried with it, but it's it's easily my least favorite of his early albums. And uh, yeah, so there you go. All right, so coming in at number 10, Herman of Mink Hollow. Yeah, Herman of Mink Hollow comes in at merely number 10. You know, I've just never been that big on this record. I mean, I like it okay, but it's just never been a favorite. And really, it should be because it has all the ingredients that are, you know, a Todd Rundgren album that I would love to have. I mean, it's almost kind of like his next something, anything, which is what everybody would sort of pine away for anyway, right? And most people consider it a return to form. Something about it just keeps me from loving it. I just don't think I like the songs as much as I do. Well, certainly not as much as I do on something, anything. But, you know... So this album came out in April 1978, and he had just broken up with Bibi Buell, or whatever her name is. How do you pronounce that? Bibi Bibi Buell? I've never known how to pronounce her name. I've only seen it written. I've never heard anybody say it. Somebody type it phonetically down in the comments. Will you help a guy out? But Todd had just broken up with her, and they had lived in the city in New York, and, well, he decided to get a place up near Woodstock on Mink Hollow Road. And he kind of holed up in this place by himself, and made this record, playing all the instruments, and, uh, well, hence the title, Herman of Mink Hollow. And, uh, yeah, he made this kind of simple, stripped-down pop album, you know, getting rid of all the, the, the prog stuff he'd been doing recently. And uh, he kind of really wanted to make a more of a piano-based pop record, right? And he wanted to showcase his vocals, because he had really started to become more and more of a, a Philly soul kind of vocalist. Uh, in 1974, he had produced... Hall & Oates' album from that year, War Babies, and after that, he kind of starts becoming a bit Daryl Hall-ish, right? But his vocals were still very nasally, if Daryl Hall-influenced, up until this album, and it's on this album where he kind of starts really singing in the in the belly, you know what I mean? He starts getting a little bit, a little huskier, and uh, I think he kind of wanted to show that off a bit on this record. And uh, he did that really well. And one of his greatest songs, one of his greatest singles is on this album, Can We Still Be Friends, uh, a song that I knew in the 70s, but I didn't know it was Todd Rundgren. I don't think I'd even heard the name Todd Rundgren when this album was on the radio or when the song was on the radio. But, yeah, I have to say, and it's probably my favorite song on the album, but this record this record will have its day. I think it's still, it's still on the rise. It's one that I think... If I keep going back to even now, I mean, I've had it for decades at this point, but I still kind of feel like I'm going to like it better someday. 
I'm going to. Don't worry, guys. It's going to be okay. Mm. Okay, so coming in at number nine is acapella. Mm. Acapella. Yes, I have this above Ballad of Todd Rundgren and Herman of Nicolo. I don't know what to tell you. I've always, I've always kind of liked this record. I mean, really, now, see, there you go. Just like Herman of Nicolo on paper is one that I should really love, that I should like so much more than I do. This is one that I probably, on paper, didn't really like that much, but I do. I can't explain it. So, now, this is, this album came out in 1985, September 85, yeah. Now, he had recorded this album in 84, and it was supposed to come out in late 84, um, but it's a, it's kind of a weird album. Now, this album is, well, it's called Acapella, and that is exactly what it is. Every sound you hear on this record is Todd's voice. Now, it's not a doo-wop record or whatever, it's, you know, kind of like a 80s synthy pop record, right? But, basically, but every sound is his voice. Every single sound. Even the drums, this is him going, you know, I mean, like that, and like running the sounds through synthesizers or different kind of zooby doobies and, uh, and coloring the same. And, well, Albert Grossman, who was the head of Bearsville, that label was basically about to go under. They, they didn't have any major selling acts on the, on the label at the time, and their days were numbered. And he was like, man, I can't put this out. Nobody's going to buy this. It's just too weird of an album. So he ended up shelving the album. And uh, well, what happened then was that the label went out of business, and Warner's uh, uh, absorbed Todd and his catalog and you know probably some of the other artists on that label as well. And during this time, somebody had gotten a hold of a test pressing of a cappella, and, well, a bootleg started circulating. And, well, because a bootleg started circulating, Warner said, well, we may as well put this out. I mean, if people are going to buy the bootleg, we may as well be making the money. So they ended up putting it out in September 1985. And, of course, yeah, it didn't really sell that much. It only sold to the hardcore Todd fans. But just the same, luckily it did come out because it's a really great album. And, uh, well, it's one of my favorite songs in this. Blue Orpheus, uh, the opening track, Johnny Jingo, Something to Fall Back On. Wasn't that a single? Now, it sounds like a single. It should be a single. But the thing is, is that the album wasn't promoted. You know, no single was promoted from the album. And, you know, hence, like, it's, you know, coming in at number 85 or 185 or what it was on the chats there. And, uh, yeah, but, man, I stand by this record. I, it's a pretty good one. So coming in at number eight, Initiation. Yeah, Initiation. Now, this, was, this came out in June 1975. Now, this is a this is a 67-minute album. 67 minutes that were, that were crammed onto a single disc. Now, it's really, Todd was really always over-recording for the albums, and, you know, he didn't want to, he didn't want to exclude anything. He wouldn't cut anything. So sometimes he would do a double album, and sometimes he would just stretch a single disc to an absolute breaking point. Now, when this record came out in 75, it was the longest single album ever released. And he had to, like, do everything he could technically to make it work. I mean, you know, he... he, he well, there was, supposedly there was a plastic shortage in 1975, so doing a double wasn't an option, so he had to try to squeeze everything he'd recorded onto a single disc. And so, like, when he was mastering, he kind of rolled off some of the bass frequencies so the, so the needle wouldn't jump. And he sped up a couple of songs, like Real Man is actually a little fast on the, song, on the album, just so he could sort of shave off the minutes here. And uh, in the end, you know, he, he did what he had to do to get every damn little note he wanted to put on this record out there. Now, I've, this is an album that I've always, for me, has always been like a half Todd album. And, uh, yeah, I mean, because side two, side one is a collection of really good Todd songs, right? Songs. Side two is a, a side-long suite, prog suite, that really is fit for, you know, uh, an early Utopia album. And then, that just ain't my bag, man. I'm just not into that stuff. I'm not really into that first, the first two live Utopia albums. I'm not into side two of Initiation. Yeah, I'm just, I'm like a, I'm a songs guy, you know, I mean, I'm not a, yeah. So, this is like a half taught album to me. And, but there's some great stuff on it. I mean, Real Man, one of his greatest songs. 
honestly, and that's the very first song I ever saw him play live. When I first time I saw him, he opened with that. So that song will always be close to my heart for that reason, if nothing else. But the song that I really don't like on it is Born to Synthesize. It's just like, man, if he could have just cut that song, I consider that song fat, but he obviously considers it something substantial. I mean, that's the second song on the record. But if he cut that, I mean, that would cut so much time off the record, and he wouldn't have had to, you know, he wouldn't have had to sacrifice sound quality to get all this other stuff on there. But, you know, that's just me. I'm sure a lot of you disagree, right? Well, let me know. Okay, so coming in at number seven, Faithful. Yeah, Faithful. That's the other half Todd album. Yes, half Todd album. Now, this came out in April 1976. And this is a half pot album, for those of you who don't know, because side one is all covers. And all faithful covers, right? Okay. So he does, you know, Yardbirds happening 10 years time ago, Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys, a couple of Beatles songs, Strawberry Fields and Rain, you know, if Six Was Nine by Hendrix, and stuff like that. And he does these perfect, as close as he possibly can, perfect replicas of the original tracks. Now, this whole album is him playing with Utopia. I mean, it's basically, it's basically a Utopia album built as a top run of an album. And, uh, you know, so it, it isn't him doing the one-man band thing. But now, side two is all original songs, kind of done in the vein, you know, with the influence of those 60 tracks. Now, the thing is, is that he had, as of 76, been in the business for 10 years. It was like his 10th anniversary, and he was kind of wanting to commemorate it in a way and, and that's why he's doing these covers of these 1966-1967 singles that he loves so much and uh, so his new material kind of showed a little bit of influence of that same material and uh, it's I, I would say it's, it's a pretty damn strong half album you know what I mean I think if there were two sides of music uh, on the level of that original side, side two, this album might come in higher. In fact, I probably, yeah, it probably would come in much, much higher, but alas, it's another Todd Half album. I've, so many times I've made tapes, you know, back in the days when you made tapes, I would make a tape where I would put side one of Initiation with side two of Faithful, and well, that was, that was one Todd album to me, and that's kind of how I ended up getting familiar with those songs and listening to those albums was that way. And, uh, but I mean, there's so many great songs on it. I mean, Black and White is a great rockin' top song. You know, Love of the Common Man and Cliche and The Verb to Love is, of course, a classic. Um, yeah, you know, come on, Todd, give us, give us another side just like that, will you? Okay, so coming in at number six is 1981's Healing. Healing. Now, this is one, now, this is one that has really, really grown on me. You know, I... I got this, well, around 89, 90, when I was kind of going through that first flurry of grabbing all the, the Rhino reissues, right? And I was a little bummed when I first played it because I I kind of liked, well, of course I liked the, the pop kind of something, anything Todd the most, but I really didn't like where he was going with his synthesizers around this time because it started just sounding, you know, like I said earlier, adult contemporary to me, you know what I mean? It just didn't sound, yeah, I just didn't like his tones, and I just didn't like, yeah, he was just going to a place that I couldn't, when I was 19 at least, that I, where I couldn't follow him. Now, so, I really haven't, up till recently, I hadn't listened to this album probably since the early 90s. I just kind of filed it away and just thought, you know, that's just one that just doesn't do it for me. So, but when I was making this list, I went over Spotify, actually, just really quick and kind of go went through the songs a little bit and realized I like this album so much more now. Like, I mean, I guess it is kind of adult contemporary or it is a little bit more adult because, well, I'm more of an adult now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 51 years old, people. So this is the kind of music that I guess you start liking when you get in your 50s. Yeah, I mean, it sounded entirely different to me than it had when I was 19. And it quickly, quickly rose on this list. I mean, honestly, had I not listened back to it and just went by my memory, it would have been toward the bottom. It would have been like one of the bottom three, but giving it a second chance, here it is coming in at number six. So, 
Yeah, you know, this is a concept album, uh, basically about spirituality and, you know, mind over matter and that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of really long pieces, especially on side two, which you think I wouldn't get into because, well, for the same reason I would get into side two of initiation. But I really like the atmosphere and the vibe of this record, and which probably is not accidental. It, it really does have a great vibe, and I think vibes is exactly what this record is about. And, uh, well, at this point, it's working on me. So, there you go, number six. Okay, so coming in at number five is the ever-popular Tortured Artist Effect. Yeah, 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 1982. November 1982 is when this record came out. Now... I don't know. Let me know in the comments. I don't really know where this album sits with fans. I don't know if this is a really uh, uh, well-liked one, or if it's just kind of people kind of, eh, okay, or, or not. But I really like this one. Now, this is one, when I was first buying, well, again, when I was collecting the, the albums during the Rhino period, this one stood up because of the cover. I really like the cover, you know, it's colorful and it's bright. And the lettering was very groovy, kind of 60s, you know. And I thought, ah, oh, you know, that's kind of psychedelic-ish sort of lettering. I really want to buy this album, but I would look at the back and i go, but it's 1982. How could this, this, this can't possibly be any good. It's, not, it's, it's 1982. Well, so finally when I did buy it and I took it home, um, it did take a minute for me to kind of get into it because it is very 1982. But... I really, I really love this record. I mean, it's now this is an album that he made just as a contractual obligation. I mean, his time with Bearsville was about to come to an end, and they weren't promoting his records anymore. You know, Healing had been the previous album, and they didn't promote that. And there was a video. There was like a video that it was on MTV from that album, and they kind of promoted it a little bit. But when it came to this record, Todd started feeling like it doesn't matter what I do. They're not really going to they're not going to promote me. So why don't I just toss off an album and not really try all that hard and see what happens. Maybe that'll be what they want. So he kind of went in and did this record with very little thought. You know, he didn't he didn't labor over it like he normally would his albums, right? And uh, in the end, I think that's what I like so much about this record. It, it is kind of uh, a little bit, it's a little fresh and it's a little bit more immediate. And uh, like, he does a great cover of King Soldier by the Small Faces that I just love. I mean, it's a little on the faithful side, but it's just, it, yeah, it sounds very much like the Small Faces version, but with a little bit more, you know what I mean? It's just a very, it's just a little bit more weight to it. And uh, I've always loved that. Hideaway is the opening track. And now, that song is a song that I kind of struggled with at first because the lyrics are kind of dumb. I've been watching how you dance, watching how you smile. A very 1982 throwaway lyrics. But in the end, you know, it's just a good, fun pop song that I really, really like a lot. Yeah, one of my favorite songs in this album is Drive. Drive. It's, it's very late in the album. It's, it's the penultimate song, I believe. It's on side two. And man, that's, this is one of my favorite songs on the record. It's the, one of the most driving tracks, as it were. And uh, one of the more you know, the sort of passionate, kind of gritty Todd vocals. I, I really love that track. I definitely, if you want to go and, and seek out what is possibly the finest track in this album, go for that one. And yeah. what else? You know, Don't Hurt Yourself. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Influenza. Yeah, there's a lot of really great tracks on this. I'm not really into Emperor of the Highway. And, you know, sometimes I like his quirky kind of, you know, dorky tracks. Sometimes I don't. This is one of the ones that I don't really like. But man, overall, I think this is a surprisingly strong album, considering the approach. Uh, it, it has a bit of an accidental hit on it. This is the album that has Bang the Drum All Day. So even if you don't know who Todd Rundgren is, you probably know the song Bang the Drum All Day. But if, if you go to sports events, you know Bang the Drum All Day. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of an accidental hit. And, uh, and I can't stand that track, but you know, whatever. Okay, so coming in number four is Todd. Yeah, Todd. Now, this album, now this came out in February 1974. It's a follow-up to Wizard of True Star. And, you know, Wizard of True Star, as you know, is like his crazy experimental album. Well, this kind of almost takes the experimentation even further. In fact, maybe even too far. And, as usual, Todd, 
he recorded way too much album for a single disc. This time, way too much to even stretch the disc out. I mean, it ended up having to be a double album. But, you know, just like when Initiation came out, there was the, the oil crisis that was going on that, meant that, that resulted in a lack of vinyl or a, or a shortage of vinyl and a shortage of plastic. And, uh, but, you know, he still had enough clout, I think, at Bearsville's time when he put this record out that they kind of went for the double vinyl. You know, there was a poster in it and the whole thing. So, yeah, they kind of still thought they had, uh, they, thought, they thought they still had a chance with him at that point. But now, when I was first going through the, 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 the catalog, you know, looking at the CDs, the, the Rhino CDs, I remember this cover stood out to me because it was so ugly, because it was so terrible. It's just this terrible head and shoulder portrait of Todd looking like he just rolled out of bed. You know what I mean? He looks like he hasn't had his coffee yet. I mean, you know, he's got pink and green dye spots in his hair, and he just looks like, he looks, he looks like he's sick. And, uh, but I still bought it because it's like, oh man, wait, this is the 1974 album? Well, this has got to be great. So I brought it home and I had to listen to it. And it's pretty spotty, but I would say there's probably a single, a single disc on it worth of outstanding tracks. And that is why it's so high on the list. Because really, yeah, I don't consider this a very consistent album. Um, there are other albums that, are, that have way more songs that I love. But if I cut, if I trimmed all the fat off of this and cut it down to a single disc, it would be a pretty tight, pretty damn good record. You know, I mean, A Dream Goes On Forever, The Last Ride, oh man, what a great Hall & Oates kind of Philly soul ballad that is. One of my favorite, favorite Todd songs, The Last Ride. You know, and then there's the little medley-ish kind of suite of Useless Begging, Sidewalk Cafe, and Is That Love? That's, those are great tracks. Heavy Metal Kids, Don't You Ever Learn, Sons of 1984. But, you know, for every one of those tracks, there's uh, In and Out the Chakras We Go and uh, The Spark of Life and all this kind of boring crap that I don't really want to listen to. So that's another one of those albums that I, I made a, a custom cassette of to listen to. Um, I don't think I ever, ever was into listening to this album all the way through as a whole. It's just too... It's too challenging. Mm. Yeah, just uh, his, his prog leanings just got too too much for me to deal with. But man, there are some gems on this album. Okay, so coming in at number three, Runt. Runt, yeah, yeah, the very first Todd Rundgren album. Technically, you know, like I already mentioned, the whole Runt band kind of thing. Um, Ruse, maybe? I don't know. But really, this is the first Todd Rundgren album. This is from 1970. And, uh, well, originally when it came out, it came out uh, with 10 tracks, and that's the, the way it was intended to come out. He had had an earlier version of the album that he kind of scrapped and, and kind of revamped it, cut off a track, cut off a couple tracks, remixed a couple of other ones, took a few tracks and cut them into a medley and, and made this newer version and said, no, this is the version of the album. And that came out, right? And, you know, he had a little single on it, uh, we Gotta Get You a Woman, great, great single, and I think it started getting, you know, it got a little bit of airplay, and uh, the album probably sold fairly decently, so Bearsville decided they were going to do another run, another print run. Well, mistakenly, they grabbed the wrong master. They grabbed that earlier version of the album that Todd had, had dumped, and which had more tracks on it and different mixes, and that's what they pressed for the second go around, and they were they pressed maybe 5,000 of them, and uh, even though they caught the mistake, they spent the money, so they put it out anyway. And so, these records, these 5,000 copies or whatever worldwide, I guess, are floating out, and they're highly, highly sought after. And I, I heard about this, but I thought, I'm never actually going to see one of these, and if I do, it's going to be $1,000, right? Well, I actually did end up getting a copy. In fact... That's it right there. I, so, okay. Now, in 2006, I was actually on the road with Todd Rundgren because I was in a band that was opening for the new cars. You remember when Todd was, was in the new cars? Well, when they were touring for that, I, the band, my band was the opening band for that tour. Now, 
we were in L.A., our L.A. stop, we were playing the House of Blues, and I decided to go over to Amoeba, and uh, when I look up on the wall, and there it was. There was a, there was a Runt album, and it had, you know, you can't tell by the cover, but they had a little, a little sticker or post-it on or whatever telling you it was the 12-track version, and it was only 40 bucks. Boy, did I buy that so fast, I couldn't, I, I, it, just, it blinded me. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the reason why, I mean, I, the reason why I'm mentioning that we were, I was on the road with Todd in this band, because it was just this sort of serendipitous, how weird is it that I would go into Amoeba while on tour with Todd Rundgren? And this is when I find this record. So, the record has even more kind of a, a meaning to me now, but... It's such a crazy, uh, it's so crazy to hear Baby Let's Swing in its original form because, as I mentioned, there is a, a suite or like a, a medley of three different songs that are cut into a medley, and Baby Let's Swing is one of those tracks. Well, on this version of the album, it's the very same version of the song, but unedited. It's the entire track, and it's so cool, so, so cool to hear it. I would love to hear, Todd, are you listening? Would love to hear the full versions of the other two songs because... Really, those are kind of my favorite three songs on the record. But there's so many good ones. I mean, Broke Down and Busted, Believe in Me is Great, uh, I already mentioned We Gotta Get You a Woman, Devil's Bite, a total Naz style tune. Uh, but, you know, some of the songs were very, you know, he, he's doing kind of his Laura Nero thing. In fact, Baby Let's Swing is, in fact, Todd writing a song about Laura Nero in the style of Laura Nero. And he kind of has a bit of a Carol King thing going on that, that's on this album and on the Ballad of Todd Rundgren as well. Kind of carries over a little bit into something, anything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a sucker for Laura Nero and Carol King wannabe stuff. So, you know, so I love this record. What can I say? Okay, so coming in at number two. Now, you guys know, all you people who have been sort of paying attention and all you Todd geeks out there, you know which two albums are left. But you don't know which order they're in. And, uh, well, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, these, these two albums, it's tough to decide which one I like better, but this might surprise you. But coming in at number two, something, anything. Yeah, I only have it at number two. It should be number one, but I have it at number two, well, because number one, and you know what number one is now, so give me a break. But, so now, he, he went in to record this album. He was fresh off of doing Bad Fingers' straight-up album, and he decided to go do his next solo album. And this time, it was truly like a solo album. I mean, there's no, there's no BS this time. It is truly a Todd solo album. In fact, he was going to go in, or he went in, to record the entire album on his own, all the instruments, everything. You know, he went to L.A., and he went to Nichols Canyon, and he, he sort of rented a house there and set up shop and was doing Ritalin, you know, just popping Ritalin like they were candy. And he was writing songs, like, he was just, just coughing them out, like he was Paul McCartney. And songs like uh, uh, Silver Light just came out all in one piece, you know. And so he was writing so much that he ended up with more than an album's worth of material, and he decided to do a double album. Now, he got about three albums uh, worth of, of the way into recording the record, and uh, one night when he was sitting there with everything all around him, all his, all the gear, you know, all torn apart and strewn about the area, he took the famous photo, the great photo inside the gatefold, you know, where he's standing on the coffee table. Well, that night when he went to bed, a huge earthquake hit L.A. and flipped him out. I mean, he's from Philly, so, you know, if you're not from California, you don't know you, you don't know those California earthquakes, especially the or the LA ones, and that just completely completely freaked him out. So he was supposed to get on a plane, or he was booked to get on a plane to New York that day. He just like fled the house, got in the car, drove around until he had to go to the airport, got on a plane to New York, and that was it. He was like, "I'm not going back to LA." He was too freaked out, and he decided he was going to finish the album in New York. And what he decided to do for the, the last quarter of the album was to get a bunch of 
musicians in the studio and go the complete opposite of the approach he had so far done. You know, he'd done the one man band, band thing and he kind of gotten sick of it and he decided he was going to do like a fully live in the studio thing. And so that's side four of the album. And that's where Hello It's Me comes in, great songs like Slut and uh, You Left Me Sore and all that kind of stuff and Piss Aaron and uh, Dust in the Wind. And it's just, it's, it's, it's basically, as, a, as far as just pop records are concerned, this is the high water mark. This is the, the record against which all other uh, pop albums are judged, right? This is the one that so many people have pined away for him to make again. And, you know, with, with good reason. I mean, this is such, such a rock-solid album. But Todd being Todd, even this album has its back. You know, the night the carousel burnt down, you know, stuff like that. But there's so much, so much great stuff on this. I mean, do I have a list? Do I have the song list here? I'm, okay, I'm going to have to wing it. Uh, you know, obviously I saw the light and Hello, It's Me, but what is there? I wouldn't, make, wouldn't have made any difference. Uh, Takes to the Tango, Cold Morning Light, Sweeter Memories, Marlene, Black Mariah. Couldn't I just tell you? So many Stone, uh, torch song, so many stone cold classic songs on this record. If you are, if you haven't really bought any Todd records yet, and you're kind of interested and you want to check it out, and you're wondering where to go first, this is the album to go to first, without question. I only have it at number two, but I'm telling you, this is your first Todd record, Todd Rundgren album, without question. Okay, so coming in at number one, as I'm sure you probably figured out, A Wizard of the True Star. A Wizard of the True Star at number one. Yeah, it's so tough to choose between these top two, but in the end, I really, this is my favorite one. There's not a single track I don't like on it. I mean, even on my favorite Todd albums, I hate to say it as much as I love him, every Todd album has at least one song that I'm just not into. Not this one. Every single track. There's no skipper track on this album. This is a perfect album beginning to end. And of course, it's another album where he crammed more than a single album's worth of material onto a single album. But now, this is, it's kind of a Sgt. Pepper, right? Wouldn't you say? This is his Sgt. Pepper. After he'd made something, and it's the follow-up to Something Anything. This came out in 1973. After he'd made Something Anything, and after his riddling kick, he started experimenting with psychedelics. So, once he started experimenting with psychedelics, he started thinking, well, these sort of Carol Kingish pop songs are kind of a little dumb, aren't they? And he kind of started thinking, I want to I wanna go further with this. I want to really kind of like expand what I do and just go so much further than I've been going. And uh, I, he just kind of started thinking that the pop thing was just kind of like, mm, kind of quaint, right? So, from the money from Something Anything and from Hello, It's Me, mostly, he set up a, a studio here in New York City, Secret Sound, and started just making a red, record where he was totally experimenting and just doing whatever he wanted to do, every flight of fancy, every little, you know, sonic, what him call it, he, he could do whatever he wanted because he had his own studio and he didn't have to pay hourly studio costs, right? And he just made this incredible album of it, that's like continuous play, one all the songs running together, and but you know this, this album didn't really sell as well, obviously as something anything, and uh, you know because it was it was his weird album, but it was critically acclaimed. I mean, and it's highly regarded. I mean, it's, anybody will tell you this is one of his best albums. Um, it only reached eighty six on the charts there, and well, but the thing about Todd is that he always did whatever he wanted to do, and he felt at liberty to do whatever he wanted to do with no regards for commerciality, because he always had a lot of money, or he always had a lot of income because he was doing a lot of producing of things. He was always producing, he's produced such huge classic albums, and so that money was always coming in, so that sort of freed him to do things like A Wizard of True Star and not worried about and not worry about if there was a Hello, It's Me on it, right? And that's why we have such a great, interesting, vast, you know, array of different types of Todd Lundgren albums, because he just doesn't care. 
He doesn't. He only wants to do what he wants to do. And I think most of the people who love Todd, that's what they love about him, right? You know, he's kind of one of those guys like Neil Young, where you kind of go, okay, it's a new Todd album, but I don't know what it's going to sound like. What's it going to sound like? Who knows? Could be anything. And uh, that's what's exciting. And this album is the most could be anything out of any Todd album. It is. It, 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 it's, you've seen the cover. Anybody who's seen the album cover for a Wizard Two Star, that image, that's what this album sounds like. It's absolutely as chaotic and, and insane as that album cover. And yeah, it's my number one. Okay, so thank you for watching. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you. If you've come this far, you rule. And uh, well, thank you for everybody who's watched all the videos, videos I've put out so far. And thank you to the subscribers. I have 26 subscribers at this point. Yes, 26. And you know what? I, I, I appreciate all 26 of you. And I appreciate the fact that there's actually 26 people who would bother to subscribe, who want to know what the next video is. And, uh, well, let's keep those numbers rising. Comment and like, and that helps the videos get out to other people so there are more subscribers. Click the bell so you know when the videos are coming out. And, uh, yeah. We'll see what the next one is. I don't even know yet. Hmm. We'll see. Bye-bye. I do this every time I make these videos and while I'm making it, I'm thinking, mm, I don't know. I'm probably going to have to edit this because I don't know what I want to say. I am uh, I'm lacking adjectives. I'm lacking adjectives. I have not unpacked my adjectives.